coffee now, how it is going to affect coffee in the future, and um, what we have done, what we are doing, and what we could potentially do about it. Um, uh, several of us from Portland Roasting attended it. It was absolutely just wonderful. Every moment of it was interesting. I learned so much, which I don't always expect to learn a bunch of new stuff in a talk like that, but I did. I learned so much. And so when Hannah said, hey, we'd like to do it again, uh, we jumped at the opportunity to host this and host Hannah. Um, we're so excited that you're here. Everything that you're about to hear is not only true, but it is important. And you being here shows that you care about this kind of thing. And so we're excited that you're here. Thank you so much for attending. Hannah is not only a wonderful speaker, uh, she's a wonderful person, a wonderful wife, a wonderful mother. I am pleased as punch that I know her and that I can call her a friend, and I am so excited for you to hear from her. So without further ado, or gilding the lily. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
most of the people that farm coffee in the world are smallholders, which means they have about, the number that I hear the most often is about two hectares of land or less. So about 75% of the people around the world who farm coffee are not making very much money off it, for one thing, um, but they also don't have a lot of resources to invest in their farms. They're not producing much coffee, they're not making much money, they therefore don't have a lot that they can invest in it. Um, and that means things like so climate change, like an irrigation system, would be out of reach for many of the smallholders. The most important thing to remember about coffee when we're talking about climate change, which may seem really obvious, but I think it can be easy to forget, is that coffee is a plant. And because it's a plant, it depends on the weather for its survival and its ability to thrive, right? Um, we drink primarily two species of coffee, uh, one's called Robusta coffee and one's called Arabica coffee. There's actually 125 species that have been identified, but the other ones are undrinkable or weird or, <laughs> or not suitable for, any, for some other reason. Um, most of what I'm going to be talking about today, the data that I present, is about Arabica coffee. That is probably primarily what you would get from a company like Portland Roasting. Um, Robusta coffee tends to be uh, in instant coffees. It is sometimes in blends of coffees that are, are higher quality, uh, but it's generally considered to be a lower quality coffee. As the name implies, it's more robust as a plant. So it can grow more vigorously, it produces more fruit. Um, it can grow, as we'll hear a little bit later, at lower altitudes in hotter climates. It can withstand drought better. So from a climate change perspective, Robusta is actually a more um, resilient plant than Arabica, which is not good for people who like really, really good coffee because it turns out that it's the really good coffee that is the most under threat from climate change. So, like I said, um, coffee is a plant. It depends on the weather and it depends on the climate for its ability to grow and thrive. And most of the people that grow it don't have the sort of financial capacity to um, modify the conditions under which the coffee's growing. They can't put it in an irrigation system, they can't put in expensive covers to create shade, etc. So they're, they're really, for most coffee growers, they're left with the weather as it is. Um, what are those specific conditions? Uh, this is what the coffee flower looks like. It's very beautiful. It smells so beautiful. It's like, if you've ever walked past like a a jasmine tree in bloom, and it's just like that perfumey kind of, it's, it's a lot like that. Um, so coffee, in order to thrive, Arabica in particular, needs very constant temperatures. So those um, seasonal swings, winter to summer, can't be too big. The day temperature to nighttime temperature can't be too big. Um, it needs a defined rainy season and dry season. Coffee actually requires a little bit of drought condition, it needs a prolonged dry period in which the plant sort of goes into a dormant phase, and then when it rains, that first big rain after that prolonged dry phase, it forces the coffee to flower. And that, the flower is what eventually turns into the fruit called the coffee cherry, the seed of which is the coffee bean that we drink. So it, it, needs, um, it needs dry and wet, but it can't, it kind of needs it to happen in a certain order at a certain time in order to really produce an even good crop. So what, what are the effects of climate change on the coffee plant? The main, the three big kind of Im impact areas are temperature, so that the temperature going, the kind of overall daytime, nighttime temperature going up, um, the amount of rain, and then lack of rain, so drought. On the temperature side, uh, when you get a little bit of temperature rise, say you get up to about 23 degrees Celsius, you start seeing the coffee fruit ripen more quickly, which wouldn't necessarily seem to be a bad thing on the face of it, but what happens when the fruit ripens really quickly is it has less time to develop the kind of volatile aromatics that make really good coffee complex. Um, this actually happened this past year in the wine region of Oregon, so there was, you know, we had like a really long, hot summer this year, not a lot of rain. So a lot of the wineries around here that had wine that don't do irrigation, 
Well, the ones that go to irrigation and they had plants that weren't well adapted for drought lost fruit. But there are some growing varieties that are more well adapted for drought, and if you had those, they actually got a huge bumper crop. So one of the wineries I was talking to had almost twice as much fruit this year as they did last year, which is, which is good. Um, the bad thing was it ripened really, really, really fast. And so it got sugar development quickly. Wine sugar translates to alcohol. They're legally not allowed to make wine over a certain alcohol content. And so they had to pick the fruit. It had so much sugar that it was gonna turn into that amount of alcohol. They had to pick the fruit but it didn't have those nice volatile aromatics um, and all of the kind of complex flavors. And so then they were sort of stuck because they, they were a really fancy winery with like, how do we make this taste good slash the way that we want it to taste without um, just that was the question, how do, we, how do we do this? And it was very, it was a lot of uh, work in the lab to try to make that balance out. So it, it's the same thing with coffee. Um, you get about one, a one degree overall average temperature rise leads to this um, impact on quality with the ripening. About 25 degrees Celsius, so two degrees more than that, you start impacting the plant's ability to photosynthesize. So it, it just can't grow. Like just think of being out in the hot sun yourself without a bottle of water, and you're just like, ugh. <laughs> That's kind of what the coffee plant does. Just ugh. Like it just, it's having a hard time that begins to impact its ability to produce fruit, um, and your production goes down. And so, and for a coffee farmer, the amount of fruit that your tree produces is how much money you have, right? It's directly related, directly proportional. You get paid based on the weight of your coffee. So less fruit, less money. So that's bad. Above 30 degrees uh, Celsius, the tree stops being able to grow. So that's when you actually start seeing physically unable to cope with climate change completely. They, they just, they die. Um, so right now, I mean, there's no one temperature of all the places in the world to grow coffee, so it's not easy to just say, okay, this is where we're at. But as a kind of benchmark in um, Central America, the average temperature has increased between 0.5 and 3 degrees depending on where you are over the last 100 years. So some, many places in Central America are already well into this scale. Either quality is being impacted or production is being impacted or the plant is not able to grow anymore. So that's, that's huge. Um, the, other, the other thing that comes with climate change, as we know, is um, sometimes a lot of rain or rain that is unseasonable. It comes at different times. I mentioned how coffee needs the dry and then the, the rain to fruit. So one thing that can happen with erratic rainfall is that it can rain at the wrong, sort of at the wrong time. Either let's say right after the flowers have been produced, you get a really, really big rain, it'll knock the flowers off, and then they don't have a chance to turn into fruit, so you lose a lot of production that way. It can rain once the fruit is ripe or almost ripening, uh, or farther along in the ripening, and it can knock the berries down and they can get to and mold on the ground and lose production that way. Um, you can have a lot of coffee, especially in Central America, is grown on very steep hillsides. When you have really heavy rains, it can cause landslides that wipe out your entire uh, farm, basically. Um, the other thing oh, that can happen is once, once the fruit has set, if you have intermittent rains, it can cause the plant to produce fruit kind of in little bursts instead of kind of all at once, which means it's just way more expensive to harvest. You've got to hire people more often to come pick the fruit as it ripens. Um, the other big problem that we see is drought. This is um, this was a major problem in Brazil last year. Brazil, remember, is the largest producer of coffee in the world. What happens in Brazil, because of the crazy way that the international coffee market works, what happens in Brazil affects producers everywhere in the world. So if Brazil suddenly has a lot more coffee, they can drive the price down. If it has a lot less, they can drive the price up, etc. cetera. Um, Brazil, yeah, I'll show a slide in a minute. Brazil is at higher risk for more drought just because of where it is and what's happening with climate change. Um, when you have drought, obviously it, it can kill the plant. Um, it can also um, lead to production losses and it can make it easier for disease 
pests to come in and take over because the plant gets kind of sick and it's just less able to fight off those bees. Those bees. So just to give you um, a visual of it, this is a, a healthy, thriving coffee plant producing cherry. The, the, it's a plant that has yellow coffee cherries, so those are right. Um, this is a picture from a farmer that we know in El Salvador and who is a big, pretty well um, capitalized producer. He can actually do a lot to help his plants. And this was the drought that they were having earlier this year. Um, you can see it reduced the cherry a lot and then it caused this like weird uneven cherry size lump and thing. So like that's terrible. If you're a farmer, <laughs> you don't want that to be what your plant looks like. Um, so that was the impact of drought on that plant. The other thing, huge, huge thing for coffee farmers that happens with climate change is that all of these things combined can make it much easier for um, the enemies of coffee to thrive. Diseases and pests often like warmer temperatures, they often like weather um, conditions, and if the plant is just weakened in any form, it makes it easier for these um, things to come in and, and take over. This is um, an image under a microscope of a fungal spore of a disease called coffee leaf rust. Um, coffee leaf rust, we're going to talk about it for a minute because it's, it's been a big deal in coffee the last few years. It's actually been around for a really long time. It was first discovered in 1892 in Ceylon. We think of Ceylon as being a place where tea is from. It used to be a major, all they had was coffee there. But the coffee leaf rust epidemic started and it completely wiped out like basically every last coffee plant and now they don't grow any coffee there. Cautionary tale. <laughs> it kind of migrated slowly across the globe. In the 70s it made its way into Central America um, or into the sort of new world and it kind of just, I mean it was a big deal, people were worried about it, but it kind of just, they sort of coexisted with it. There weren't really massive um, losses in Central America. Then in 2012, uh, well, in 2007 in Colombia and then in 2012 in Central America, kind of overnight, nobody saw it coming. This huge epidemic happened. Um, and in the end, uh, it has cost over a billion dollars to the coffee industry in Central America. About 400,000 people have lost their jobs um, in coffee. And because of the particular way that this disease impacts the plant, and, and really the, because coffee is a tree crop, um, it's not it's not like something you put in the ground and you harvest it that year and then the next year you put it in the ground again and you harvest it. You put it in the ground once and then every year it produces. Um, you have to wait usually three to four years for that first production to happen after you plant it. Um, leaf rust is so impact it causes the leaves to fall off the trees. Like the plant gets so sick with this with these fungal spores, the leaves fall off, but leaves are how plants get energy. Like they face up to the sun photosynthesis happens and that's how they're able to have that energy to produce fruit. When all the leaves fall off, it can't produce fruit. And so you end up having an impact that lasts two to three to four years before the plant's able to recover, if it's able to recover. And so you had areas in Guatemala, in Nicaragua, in El Salvador, in Honduras, where 70-80% um, of the farms were having leaf rust and they were, some of them were losing 70 to 80 percent of their coffee to the disease, and that was, you know, once it happened, once it started happening, you know, not only is that my income for this year, that's my income for the next two to three years. Um, and again, I'll just reiterate: most coffee farmers are smallholders; they don't have the ability to weather that kind of impact on their livelihood. That shock, economic shock. Um, this is this is just a slide to sort of put that in perspective. Um, this is an, an estimate from a great uh, organization called Catholic Relief Services that does a lot of work in the coffee lands, as they call it, uh, on the number of farm workers that were displaced by the coffee leaf rust epidemic. Uh, this only goes through um, 2014, so it's a year out of date. Um, but it's like, <laughs> look at this, it's crazy, 200,000 people. Um, so it, it really, has had a significant impact on the coffee industry as a whole in Central America. And what we're seeing now that we're sort of two, three years into this, we're sort of kind of getting the, the sifting out of 
how different countries have responded to this and what kinds of like policy mechanisms they've put in place to deal with it. And um, countries like Honduras, which were very proactive, um, very invested in the coffee sector, they're sort of starting to rebound. And they're getting more of their production back and they're seeing more of their um, workforce re-engaged in the coffee sector. Countries like El Salvador, which had smaller losses to begin with, um, but they, are, they have basically said, like, we can't grow coffee here anymore. Um, so there, there's no kind of institutional framework of support for coffee in El Salvador. But there's not much now. And so um, I was just talking to Nathaniel from, from here who buys coffee from Portland Rossi earlier. And it's true, it's, I haven't seen a coffee from El Salvador um, at a specialty coffee shop in the last year. It's just, it's, so, it's much harder to get your hands on. And what happens when, when those areas go out of production, it doesn't, they could come back in eventually, but they're not going to come. If they're gone now, they're not going to come back next year. Um, they're probably gone until the government decides that they want to reinvest in coffee, which they may never do, or they may not do for another 30 or 40 years. Um, so it's a little scary. Um, to put kind of a human face on it, there was a really fantastic article in the, um, uh, New Orleans paper, newspaper, but I'm forgetting the name of the paper, trying to speak in. Yeah, thank you. Um, that actually told the story of a family that was displaced by coffee, were coffee farmers, farm workers in, um, I think, Honduras, that left Honduras and came to the U.S. as economic migrants. Um, and this is something that's like in the news a lot right now, right? Economic um, migrants. Um, and we, in Oregon, are a place where a lot of Farm, former farm workers in Central and South America um, migrate too because we have work that is familiar to them. I don't know this for a fact, but I would not at all be surprised if there are not hundreds of people who live in Oregon now who used to farm coffee or work as farm laborers in coffee who have left their former livelihoods um, to relocate here. If you look at those aggregate numbers, 300,000 people, some of them probably were able to switch to other other crops or other things or move to the city and find other, other livelihoods, but many of them probably left. Oh, and I had a great, um, there was another really great article, um, I didn't write down the name of the newspaper, but I can, I can give the link to anybody if you want it, um, that looked at farm laborers in El Salvador. So sometimes, I think we, we talk about like coffee farmers, um, but the other huge segment of people involved in, in creating and supporting the coffee trade are the people that are employed by farmers, right? They're the, the people who come and pick the coffee. The labor is typically very seasonal, um, and they may do other things at different times of the year. They tend to be sort of like economically at the bottom of the ladder. Um, this article was interviewing a woman who said she used to be able to pick two quintals, which is just a, it's a kind of local measurement for how much coffee. It comes out to about like 92 kilos. Uh, a day, and she earned around eight dollars to do that. You can imagine uh, picking like ninety-two kilos. That's like three hundred, three hundred pounds, and like two hundred pounds. Like imagine picking two hundred pounds of fruit. You make eight dollars a day. Um, but with the with the epidemic and then subsequent additional issues they've been having with the weather in El Salvador, she was only able to pick one quintal, which meant she was earning three dollars a day. So like, these are real, uh, the point I'm trying to make, I don't want to like be completely depressing, but just is these things that seem abstract, like climate change, actually are connected to uh, people and to the ability of this industry to sit, uh, succeed. So um, the organization that I work for, which is called World Coffee Research, does well, many different things, but one of the things that we did last year was we did um, an analysis, a study of uh, sort of climate projections globally. No one has, no one had ever done this sort of, attempted to do this sort of global projection of how is climate change going to impact the different areas of the world. They'd only been done in sort of country by country. Um, and so, um, I'm going to, I'm going to show you a slide of what uh, the current kind of suitable areas for the suitable climate zones for growing coffee are. You can't see the color differences. They just look like. Gray. <laughs> variations on gray, but basically if it's got a color on it, it means you can grow coffee there right now. 
The next slide is where you can grow coffee in 2050. And I'm going to switch back a couple times just so you can kind of see uh, the impact. Look at Brazil. Okay, so it's a lot less, right? <laughs> so uh, the prediction that, uh, that we did, which is not definitive, I mean, climate modeling is the least exact science um, in some ways in the world. Um, however, the sort of general trend tracks with other climate prediction models that have been done, um, and the, I think that the sort of general takeaway is a sound one. Um, our prediction looks, says that about 50%, we're going to have about half as much land in 2050 as we do now for growing Arabic coffee, um, if, assuming nothing is done to adapt coffee, uh, or we're not able to like halt. Assuming we're, assuming we're not somehow reducing or reversing global climate change by then, which pretty much is not possible to do at this point. Um, so, and most of the impact is going to be felt in areas that are already hot and dry. Brazil is already, for the most part, hot and dry. So Brazil, which is currently the biggest producer of coffee in the world and whose coffee market drives the entire world economy of coffee, is looking at pretty major um, losses. One thing that's sort of positive in the study is that many of the areas that are currently known for like really high quality coffees, um, so lots of areas in say Colombia and Central America, and then also like um, Ethiopia, Kenya, uh, they are gonna be less impacted. Even in the areas that are less impacted, we're still looking at a 30% decline. In the hot, dry areas, so parts of Brazil and, and some parts of Nicaragua and some, a few other places, we're looking at an So, does that, does that mean we're just like, my kid, I have a one year old, like, is she just not gonna be drinking coffee <laughs> for breakfast in 2050? Um, and the short answer, no, but how coffee is grown is going to look very different. Um, the price of coffee is probably gonna look different. Um, for example, it's possible that there will be more big farms, that smallholders will just not be able to accommodate these changes. One of, the, um, one of the sort of findings of, of this kind of study is that you can chase the cooler, more even temperatures that you need for coffee up. So you can go up in altitude and get um, what you need. Well, smallholders don't really have the ability to do that, right? Their farms are very small. There are lots of coffee farms around the world where they have, they're bigger and they have land kind of in in a gradation, and so they might move their top elevations to higher quality coffees, and maybe at the low elevations they switch to other crops. That's a good strategy for medium sized and larger farms. Smallholders um, are going to have a lot of trouble. It's quite possible that we'll see more robusta coffee and less arabica coffee. That farmers will just switch crops, but not to like beans. They'll just switch to something they already know, um, but that is a little bit different and can tolerate. Um, and in fact, we're he you know we are already hearing about this happening. For example, in India, um, they have a really a significant disease there called the coffee berry borer. It's a pest, not a disease. Uh, coffee berry borer. Say that five times fast. And in the seventies, they produced. I, I mean, I'm not positive I'm getting the statistics right, but it was something like seventy percent arabica coffee, thirty percent robusta coffee, and forty years later, it's completely the opposite um, because they just the, the disease was too prevalent and they just could not um, farmers just were losing too much production but the robusta is more robust and it was more resilient and so they were able to switch um, we're probably going to be seeing more coffee from China which is kind of fun um, <laughs> China is investing very heavily in coffee right now there um, a lot of former tea land is being replanted in coffee in the Province, which is where Pu'er tea is from, um, and they're expecting to continue to make that investment and grow. Right now, globally, it's not a huge amount of coffee, but they moved from being like the 60th largest producer of coffee to they're now the 14th largest. They're bigger than Kenya and Tanzania combined. Um, and as Asian markets are increasingly drinking more coffee, uh, that could become, you know, so some of that increased production. Could So this was 
from a, this is a quote from an article that was called, a great article that was published just like last week, um, looking at how coffee farmers in uh, Nicaragua in particular are, and well, they talked about El Salvador and Honduras too, are switching from coffee to cocoa. Uh, because and these were specifically farmers that have lower elevation farms. They were like 300 to 500 meters. You can't really grow coffee under 600 meters well, so even there, they were already probably marginal for coffee. Um, but cocoa likes that with those warmer temperatures. And so uh, countries like Honduras and El Salvador are investing in cocoa in a big way. Honduras says they plan to for 8% of their coffee land to um, cocoa. El Salvador is making some more kind of investments. Um, yeah, so, and this was just, this was a quote from a coffee farmer who was like, I just can't do it. It was so expensive to renovate my farm to like take care of the plants properly and I was earning so little money I just couldn't do it anymore. Um, this is a guy who used to work for the ICO, gave a talk last year, and his analysis was that um, and, and this is sort of based on the same idea that smallholders are just, they're just not going to be resilient en um, enough, which makes it sound like I'm blaming them, and I'm, <laughs> I don't mean to. They're just, they're, they just don't have the capacity to uh, withstand some of these changes. Um, so where are the areas that have, are the highest proportion of smallholders? It tends to be Central America and parts of East Africa. Um, countries like Brazil have bigger farms, more technified farms. They will have more resources that they can So that's the depressing part. <laughs> but, but there is stuff that can be done. Um, and there are organizations um, like the one that I work for that are, that are thinking very actively all the time about how we can, especially for these higher quality coffees, how we can at least fight a good retreat, you know? <laughs> like, um, probably, I'll pause before I go into this and talk about prices for a second. Probably, if you look at everything I was just saying, what's going to happen? is that the best coffees are going to get more expensive because there's going to be less land to grow them, there's going to be fewer people to farm them, there's going to be, uh, it's just going to require more to do it. That doesn't necessarily mean that there's going to be a global coffee shortage because there might actually be more coffee. There might be more robusta coffee, for example, grown around the world. Um, so the relationship between these two kinds of coffees and the availability in the market is, is complicated. But probably the best coffee probably will not run out of coffee anytime in our lifetimes. <laughs> I don't see that happening. But you might have to start doing it soon, so no. Um, so so what, can, what can we do about it? So when, when climate change scientists talk about, which I should say I am not, uh, I'm not a scientist at all. I should, I should have said that at the beginning. Um, when they talk about kind of how we deal with climate change, you usually hear two words, adaptation and mitigation. Adaptation means well, if we're stuck with this, what do we do about it? How do we act to uh, adapt ourselves to this new reality? Mitigation means how do we try to reduce our carbon footprint? How do we actually try to mitigate and turn the underlying causes of climate change around? So I'm going to talk about those two things separately. So um, for adapting coffee, um, this is, this looks confusing, but <laughs> this is cool. The guys on the top are taking pollen from, from flowers, coffee flowers, and they're scraping it into little bags so that they can put it on little paintbrushes and paint it onto the flowers of other coffee plants and create experimental new coffee varieties. Um, so this is actually work that the scientists that I work with are doing. This right here is the result of one of those experiments. It's the, it's the new, it's the baby coffee. Um, so we'll be picking these coffee cherries um, this coming soon, now, sometime very soon, um, and planting them in the ground, growing them into little baby plants, and then doing a lot of different analyses to try to see if they uh, can have certain traits, basically. One of them is that we're testing for drought tolerance, one of them that we're testing for is resistance to coffee leaf rust, and a couple other diseases and pests. Um, but one of the other things that, um, that we're doing that is a little bit different than what has historically been done by coffee breeders is we're really paying attention to quality first. So um, the parent 
prints of this plant were uh, very high quality copies. Uh, so this is this is one technique that you can use to adapt copy, right? You can try try to create new copies that are more resilient to the challenges at hand. Most of the coffee varieties that farmers use right now were developed. Um, if if they were developed, some of them are kind of um, natural natural occurring naturally occurring varieties. But the ones that were developed were developed in the seventies, and they kind of don't take into account the reality. They're not well suited for the twenty first century. It's sort of an outdated. One way to look at it is it's kind of an outdated technology. Um, so that's one way you can adapt. Um, one of the things that actually a lot of people are very excited about about coffee and climate change is that coffee has incredible potential to be uh, a positive. I still don't know the right terminology for this. It can be good for climate change. That's not quite what I mean, but you'll see what I mean in a second. So coffee evolved naturally in forest in Ethiopia, which means to, it can grow really well under tree cover. That's awesome when you're talking about climate change. Right? Because trees are carbon sinks. Um, they have, if you are able to like plant a big shade population over your coffee plants, you're actually doing a sort of net benefit for the planet um, when it comes to climate change. So really high quality coffees also really like shade and benefit from coolness of the grains. So there's many benefits to um, growing coffee under shade, and then I think there will be a lot of renewed focus on that in the coming couple of years. There was sort of this like thing for a while. Shade and bird friendly coffee was really like kind of cool, and then that just you just like stopped hearing about that completely. I think you're going to start hearing about that again because it's going to be really important for, for climate change. And so, a lot of folks that work in sustainable agriculture in the developing country um, they like coffee because it's way better than, say, beans or maize, where you have to grow it in full sun and you rip up the you know hillside and you then cause lots of problems also with runoff into the water supply. So coffee isn't always grown in a super um, environmentally sustainable way, but it can be, and when it is, it can be a very good thing. So that's adaptation. Mitigation. So this is the, like, how do we reduce the carbon footprint of coffee? Um, so you guys, I don't know if you know, but in um, December, end of November, early December, there was a huge gathering of all, most of the nations in the world to talk about um, renewing to climate change the last time we had a sort of signature that this was um, the part of these parties coming together and agreeing was in Kyoto, which is like 20 years ago. Um, what happened in Paris this year was really interesting because it was the first time that developing countries were invited to the table. And what immediately came out of these, um, even before they started, but definitely once everyone was in the same room, uh, came out of these negotiations was very clear kind of, hey, you developing countries, oh, I'll come back to this. You developing countries produce, the richest 10% of countries produce 50% of the CO2 emissions in the world. And the poorest 1% produce basically nothing. Um, so, um, you know, the whole thing of, of the Paris talks was to get people to sit around and agree to how they were going to mitigate their climate change impact. And a lot of the poor countries you can't ask us to do all this stuff <laughs> when you're not going to sort of step up and do it yourself. Um, and there's a really interesting um, parallel there that I'll come back to in, um, when we're talking about coffee, sort of consuming coffee, the, the role that we have here on the sort of cafe side of things in the US and um, coffee farmers. Um, but there was, coffee had a really interesting role at the Paris talks um, because Costa Rica presented the very first, it's a technical thing called a NAMA, a Nationally Appropriate Mitigation Action Plan um, for the coffee sector. It is the only, um, it was the only, it is still the only coffee specific um, carbon mitigation plan that was presented at Paris. It's one of the very few that was submitted for agriculture at all. Um, and basically what it is, is it's a plan for how they can make coffee farming in Costa Rica more, um, how they can mitigate their CO2 emissions from farming. So where do CO2 emissions come from in farming? They come from use of fertilizers, especially nitrogen fertilizers. Um, 
they come from coffee processing when you are um, when you have the wet processing in particular creates uh, the byproducts create uh, methane off gassing and methane is like actually fairly small compared to carbon in terms of its contribution to um, to climate change but it in and of itself like you put like one molecule of nitrogen and one molecule of methane the nitrogen has a way bigger climate um, warming so a little bit of methane goes a long way, which is incidentally why drinking lattes is less carbon friendly than drinking black coffee. In case you needed one more reason to not drink milk in your coffee, um, because because milk uh, cows produce a lot of methane, so they're actually like big climate idiots, you know. <laughs> Cow farms are terrible for the planet. Um, so avoiding avoiding methane through improved um, treatment and, and use of uh, the byproducts of washing, um, and then also carbon capture through agroforestry. So they're actually going to incentivize farmers to put in these shade coffee things by giving them um, financing so that they can plant shade trees. Um, so this is this is really cool. I mean, it's it's just it's cool. Like no other country is doing this. Almost no other agricultural. Um, really awesome for Costa Rica. Um, it costs a lot of money. They're trying to get $20 million in financing um, to make this happen. And that would be on top of $10 million that they just spent at their own. So, um, so I mean, the whole the kind of point of like, like this is cool, and then you look at this and you're like, well, why is it Costa Rica's job? <laughs> well, like, why, why are we asking farmers to take the onus of this stuff? Um, and here is a really great that I think just makes the connection more direct. So it's really hard to calculate a carbon footprint. And um, the guys from Portland University can talk about that a little bit later. But uh, there have been two, based on a kind of aggregate of a couple of things that I've looked at, roughly this is, I think, pretty accurate, um, that the amount of carbon from kind of seed to cup, about half of it occurs at the cafe. So, and that's like electricity. Well, we'll look at what's on the only about 20% of it occurs at the farm itself. So that's, again, fertilizers, um, the use of it. So if you're like on a, if you're like a smallholder who like can't even afford these fertilizers, you don't even have that much of it. Um, the mill transport, this means like shipping on a container ship. You would think it would take a lot of carbon to get coffee from like Kenya to here. It actually doesn't because container ships are so efficient. They have so many containers onto a boat, um, that it really is kind of almost manageable in the scheme of things. And then even roasting, like this doesn't even account for roasting. This is this is straight up like making your cup of coffee and getting it to you over the counter. Right? It's pretty amazing. Um, so it, it's like kind of amazing in a bad way, but it's also amazing in a good way, right? Um, that means that the largest opportunity we have to make an impact on climate change in coffee is actually here. It is actually in the cafe. Um, and there are actually things that you can do. Um, but it's kind of hard to know exactly where to like apply the most effort. Um, I, this is a slide from Counterculture Coffee. They're a roaster based in North Carolina. Um, and they have done a lot of transparency reporting about their, um, and they've attempted to calculate their carbon footprint. Um, and the reason I wanted to show this slide is because I would have thought a coffee roaster, like probably your biggest contributors are the, the, the roasting itself. It takes like a lot of natural gas, maybe a lot of power or like electricity to keep you know all the water boilers going. No, they're by far their biggest uh, thing, carbon footprint element was shipping. And that's because they're a wholesale roaster. So they roast all their coffee in one facility and then they have cafes all over the US to sell it. And so they just take all that coffee they roast in it. They don't have only one facility, they've got a couple of them, but these central hubs and they ship it like through FedEx to places. And that accounts for by far the biggest percentage um, of, their, of their stuff. So um, how, like, how, how do you know this? <laughs> How, if you're like work in a cafe or you own a cafe or a roastery and you are interested in trying to get your head wrapped around what some of the opportunities are, like how do you do it? Um, Portland roasting does it really well. Did I just say that in normal English? Or, or yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it sounded really weird in my head, okay. Um, <laughs> Portland roasting does it really well and really deeply. So rather than trying to just talk at you about what 
Waterviews. Waterviews per employee increased significantly in 2014, in part because we opened our cafe in 2013. Our packaging profile indicator looks at total weight of packaging used per pound of coffee roasted, which has decreased steadily since 2011. This also helps to see how much of our packaging is compostable and recyclable, and how much will help to send to the landfill after it's used. The vehicle fuel indicator looks at how much fuel we're using in our company owned vehicles. In 2014, we reduced fuel use per pound of coffee roasted by 15%. Our waste composition indicator helps us see how much waste we're generating and how much of that waste we're able to compost and recycle. In 2014, our total waste increased by 8%, showing room for improvement. Another part of what we track is the external or indirect impact of our business. For example, we track how our employees commute to work and encourage them to bike or take public transportation when possible by providing a bike rack in a secure area and sharing the cost of bus passes. We also measure the impact of all our business travel. This, of course, includes travel to business meetings and industry events, but also trips to source and coffee. Lastly, we look at the impact of our deliveries. For our local customers, we use Beeline Sustainable Urban Delivery Price for our own Portland Grocery Delivery Service. However, the main component here is third party shipping that we use to send our coffee nationwide. Additionally, we track the type and source of our coffee purchases most of which come from South and Central America. 2014 was a good year, and our sustainability efforts paid off. But there's always room for improvement. Some indicators are still moving in the wrong direction. And as we grow, our overall emissions continue to increase. Natural gas and electricity usage are two major sources of emissions, but we are pleased that we have continued to find ways to roast our coffee more efficiently. Another large source of carbon emissions comes from third-party shipping. And as our company continues to grow our business nationally, this is an area we can try to improve. And as we spend more time tracking this data, we can better see patterns and trends in our sustainability efforts and plan for continued improvement. To mitigate our impacts, we are committed to avoiding, reducing, and offsetting emissions. After avoidance and reduction efforts, we can appropriately offset the impact of those emissions we do create make sure that our business remains carbon neutral overall. In 2014, we purchased renewable power to cover 100% of our electricity use, and trees for the future can do 10,000 trees in our app. This not only protects local animal habitats, but also offsets some of the carbon emissions that we create, helping us to stay carbon neutral. In addition to our environmental projects at home, we support multiple community projects working to fulfill the land development goal. For our business and our world future. All right. I think you get the idea. Did you know that that was Nathaniel doing the voice? Yeah. <laughs> 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 he can like throw his voice at the series. <laughs> so it's been a very serious part of our business to try and track this and then um, mitigate. And one of the uh, biggest things that we have found is, um, just like Hannah said earlier, it seems like the gigantic smokes peeling machines that we have in the back would really be the biggest part of our um, our carbon emissions. But it turns out it's, it's when we have deliveries from uh, UPS or FedEx or whoever we're shipping with, that is where the vast majority of our, our carbon emissions goes. And so that has been a challenge because that's not necessarily something we have control of. We can't say uh, UPS and FedEx only send us your uh, electric vehicles or your um, natural gas vehicles or sorry um, biodiesel vehicles we, we take what they send and we try and do things in a way that is um, financially um, manageable for our customers we can't just ship things in the most expensive uh, way possible and say sorry it's carbon neutral <laughs> um, and so it's been a challenge but it's a challenge that we have been able to um, mitigate in other ways around our business one of the most exciting things, we bought the biggest roaster we've ever bought in our company's history and had it installed 95% of the way about two weeks ago. Um, and though it is a gigantic roaster, rather than buying an afterburner that runs at a massive, massive temperature and uses a ton of natural gas, we purchased it with a catalytic oxidizer, which does exactly the same job at half the temperature and requires significantly less natural gas. And then on top of that, um, 
we were able to partner with a company in um, Denver that is producing generators that will take all of the residual heat from that catalytic oxidizer, convert it to electricity, and then power the entire building just off of the residual heat from one of our three roasters. Which is incredible! <laughs> that means that while we're roasting coffee, we're actually sustaining this building exclusively off of the coffee that we're roasting. And so that is going to help us uh, long into the future continue to be carbon neutral and continue to have the commitment to sustainability that we've tried to have and play, granted, a very, very, very small part in um, mitigating and reducing global climate change. But I'm able to come to work every day. Everyone that works at Portland Roasting is able to come to work every day. And I feel good about what we're doing. And I feel good about um, the amount of lives that we are hopefully impacting and knowing that it is actually better for the environment that this building is here roasting coffee than if it weren't here roasting coffee, which is nice. That's cool. I think, so one of the things I think that's interesting about this sort of thing is like you can't, you can't do something about something you can't see. And right. so much of our sort of our relationship to climate change is invisible, right? And we just don't, I have absolutely no idea what my carbon footprint is. Just none, I have no idea. I have a vague sense of some of the things I can do to reduce it. Um, but I think what's really admirable about what you guys have done is just like really put in the effort, and it is a lot of effort, to see it, to make it visible, to look at. Yeah, when you go into an Excel spreadsheet every month and you have to bypass bike to work, bikes to work, and you go to car, and you're like, I drove every day. <laughs> then, yeah, it really helps you to see what it is that you're doing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, um, so, um, I, I don't have a lot to add to that. I think, um, you know, there are, there are small things that um, cafes can do now to, you know, if every cafe in the U.S. replaced two light bulbs with, CFLs. I'm going to call them CFCs, which is not fair. <laughs> Carbon fluorescent, compact fluorescent, something or others. Um, here, I have it. I have it. It's right here. Uh, it, we would say like 5,300 tons of CO2 emissions each year, which is a lot. Um, so there are, there are a lot of little things that can be done. Um, I think I mentioned request milk. <laughs> Use less waste. Everyone knows that. But really do it. Um, and, and really, it's, it, I think I think there's a lot um, there's a lot to explore in, in this territory. There's some you know you have an amazing resource here in Portland in, in Portland Roasting about how to do this stuff well. Um, so I totally meant to like pause as I was going. You can turn the lights back on um, and take questions as they arose, and I just forgot to do that. So <laughs> I apologize. Um, but really, if anybody has questions for me or for the Portland Roasting, I'm happy to answer them. Yeah? You showed one slide about the adaptation that was going on uh, mm -hmm. with the, in the lab. It looked like it was mm -hmm. in Latin America. So was, where was that and who was involved? So um, that was at um, a research facility called CATIE, which is an acronym that's C-A-T-I-E. It's in Costa Rica. Um, and they actually are a regional research facility. They do agricultural research for kind of all of Central America. Um, and they are partners of my organization, which is called World Coffee Research. So um, it was our project. Uh, it was our scientists, but we were collaborating with um, some folks there and using their facilities. Um, and then have, I'd be happy to give more information about the, our programs around variety development. Uh, but there are um, coffee breeding programs, active ones in Colombia and in Brazil, period, pretty sophisticated. Uh, Central America has a, a coalition of countries that has historically done a lot of really great breeding work. They're not doing it right now. Um, and then basically most of the rest of the world doesn't have very much. Um, we, we're, our organization is starting to um, work on a platform where we might be able to get something well in East Africa, maybe, next year. But it, it requires like governments to be willing, and that's a lot of work sometimes. Yeah. Hey, Juan, I'm here. So you had a couple of consecutive slides that were talking about the transportation of coffee, mm -hmm. and um, you kind of missed what the differentiation was between, like, so the first one, it said, like, 7% or so of the uh, carbon emissions in the oh, US yep, were yep, yep. Um, <coughs> transportation, and then the next one, it said the highest number of um, Yes. 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 Um, but yeah. Sorry, that was confusing because they're not really directly. They weren't really looking at the same set of facts. Yeah. So I'll just. 
So the first one that showed the 7% was, was, a, was a study that looked at um, the total carbon footprint of the whole life cycle of coffee, starting from the farm all the way to the cafe. And what that 7% number represented was the amount, you know, the percentage of the total carbon cycle that went to shipping coffee from the green coffee, like from the coffee farm to the cafe, basically. So it left, say, Kenya or Colombia, got on a boat, came here. That travel represented 7% of the total carbon footprint for, for coffee. The other one was looking specifically at um, this one company, which is a roaster that doesn't operate any cafes. They're just a wholesale roaster. So their total carbon footprint, meaning not the stuff at the farm, of everything that they do, the biggest proportion had to do with shipping their roasted coffee out to their wholesale cafe clients. So like the stuff that's already in the bag. And that means basically FedEx and a bunch of stuff getting on trucks and going across the US. So, and that was, that's a bigger number. The other thing um, I was gonna point out on that, there, there was also another line on that same slide about air travel. And um, traveling by plane is like the worst way, like, from a carbon perspective, it's the worst mode of transport that you can do. And um, interestingly, some, you know, some of the coffee companies that are doing more like direct trade coffee, which, which has some really great benefits, um, but they, they have a really big proportion of their carbon footprint comes from air travel because they're doing a lot more travel. Um, so, and, and I will be totally transparent and say our company or my organization, which is an NGO, is also completely guilty of this. We have seven employees, we all work in different countries, and we fly around the world to meet each other all the time, like many, many times. these 
very hard for coffee farmers, again, being those the smallholders, to access financing, meaning credit. Like, they don't have lines of credit that they can use to go get that extra 25 cents um, to do it. So I think eventually there might be something like that. Um, you should, you yeah. Mark? So what Mark is talking about is, um, I, I gloss over really quickly, but when the coffee leaf rust epidemic first happened, it actually happened first in Colombia, starting around 2007. And Colombia has a really a pretty good research and development program, and they had been working on these varieties that were resistant to leaf rust. And so the Colombian government mobilized really, really quickly and put it, they spent a lot of money doing it, but they basically went out and gave these leaf rust resistant varieties to farmers for and paid them money so that when they took out their old plants and put in the new ones, they wouldn't lose that production to kind of cover and smooth it over. So they had all these kind of financing mechanisms that they used. Um, but the result of it was that Columbia saw an impact of leaf rust for like a year or two, like a little bit of a dip, but now they're right back where they were before, kind of on the, on globally, they're producing as much coffee as they were before, and they lost very, very little land to coffee production in doing that. Um, company, or countries like El Salvador that have been really impacted by the press but had no response, no kind of coordinated response, they, they're probably going to lose 30% of their coffee land, if not more, and it won't come back. So I thought of that would be pure conservers. Uh, uh, yeah. yeah, we helped with that trial. Were and uh, he is involved in conversations with like the 
Colombian government. And so, you know, it was really about like how do our how, ultimately in the end it was about how do we as the people who spent the money on this stuff have the power to dictate what happens in this value chain. And it turns out we have a lot of power. Um, but we often are making decisions based on assumptions or kind of halfway information. Um, and sometimes that can be, sometimes it's just whatever, but sometimes it can actually be very detrimental to, to farmers that we don't know what we're talking about. Well, we just heard that we, before we went to Honduras, we were just in Honduras in mid-January, um, I heard from uh, multiple importers that we buy from, oh, you don't want to buy from Honduras because you'll never find a copy there that scores above an 82. And then we went to Honduras, and there were lots of copies that scored 85 and 86. And we're like, this is amazing. And like, it turns out Honduras and copies are actually pretty great. But historically, we haven't liked Honduran copies because they're not Guatemalas or Colombias. And so we have actually, um, not we as a company, but just as an industry, we have purchased less high quality specialty, specialty Hondurans. And so the Hondurans have had to sell it for a lower price because we don't think it's that good. But it turns out it's pretty good and it's just, it's a, it's a horrible, <laughs> it's a vicious, vicious cycle, cycle that just keeps yeah. on going because of our assumptions yeah. that are based not on reality, but on what yeah. we've always heard or always known. So there's a theme. Can you pick up the theme then? <laughs> yeah. Data, information, research. Ha, ha, ha.